Welcome to the History of the World podcast. My name is Chris Hasler. And you're listening to Volume 2, The Ancient World. This is Episode 10, The Religion of Canaan and Phoenicia. first job this week in one of the more difficult podcasts that I've had to write is to explain L. L, spelt E-L, is a deity. Deities have been mentioned many times in relation to Near East worship. Over the course of these Volume 2 episodes, we can recognise that many ancient world cultures had a number of gods, and each of these gods would represent an aspect of the world. In each culture, there may be a god of crop fertility. There may be a goddess of pregnancy. There may be a god of craftsmanship. There may be goddesses of fruit or love. There may be gods of the moon, and the sun. This was the typical polytheistic nature of Near East worship. Often in cities there would be a supreme deity. For example, in Babylon the supreme deity was Marduk. And we know of Marduk because any time that Babylon was conquered, the aggressors would take the statue of Marduk which was a sacrilegious act designed to spiritually weaken the city, at least in the minds of the 2nd millennium BCE Near East population. In Or, we find the supreme deity called Inanna, who was worshipped especially by Sargon of Akkad's daughter Enheduanna, after Sargon had conquered the city of Or in the late 3rd millennium BCE. Ashur was the national god of the Assyrians and was the supreme deity of the first capital city of Assyria, namely Assur. These are just some of the supreme deities that we have stumbled across during our journey through the ancient Near East. But these cultures of Babylonia, Sumeria and Assyria would have many other minor deities too. So the style of religion was very much polytheistic, which means to worship multiple gods. El was the name that many cultures gave to their supreme deity. So the name very likely represented a different spiritual entity in each individual culture. But essentially, it was the name of the supreme god Although there are cognate words used throughout the Near East, so in some cases El is Il and Ilu, among others, depending on when and where in the Near East you were, El is is understood to be the word that Canaanites used for their supreme deity. The list of other deities in any chosen religious worship of any particular Near East culture could be described as its pantheon of deities. And in Canaan, El was the leader of the pantheon of deities, and Asherah, the goddess of motherhood and fertility, was his queen consort. Now, Canaan differed from Mesopotamia. In Mesopotamia, there were the rivers of the Tigris and the Euphrates, and it was somewhat easy for the residents who lived on the banks of these rivers to manipulate the flow of the rivers by building irrigation canals and therefore aid in the facility of the land to enhance the success of the agricultural yield. Something vital for the survival of the large and advanced societies of Mesopotamia, especially when it came to having a surplus of harvest 
to be able to trade with. In Canaan, however, this was not so easy, and the Canaanites relied heavily on rainfall to be able to assist with the success of their own agriculture. Therefore, it should come as no big surprise to learn that the supreme Canaan deity, El, was the god of water. Ba'ul. Once again, like the word El, Baal is also quite ambiguous when trying to give it a specific meaning. In many Semitic languages, Baal and its cognates across the languages is the word given to a man of significant standing, so it could be a lord or a master or even a husband. In the eyes of the Canaanites and in respect of their deities, Baal would have been known as the god of rain or otherwise as the rider of the clouds. We can see from excavation of scripts from Ugarit that the local Levantine people of the 2nd millennium BCE regarded Baal as the god of the weather in general. If you recall, we spoke of Ugarit during episode 6, which was our late Bronze Age collapse episode. It was the city of the Levant that was under the influence of the Hittite Empire at the beginning of the 12th century BCE and it appealed to the Alashia Kingdom of Cyprus for help against invaders. Sadly, the appeal was to no avail as the city of Ugarit fell. But at least this does mean that we know that the worship of Baal existed in this geographical area previous to 1200 BCE. One of the texts from Ugarit reads, Lo, also it is the time of his reign. Baal sets the season and gives forth his voice from the clouds. He flashes lightning to the earth. How else would ancient people interpret a violent thunderstorm as anything other than a spiritual reaction by higher power. Another god worshipped by the people of Ugarit was the one called Mot. Mot was considered to be a son of El and also the personification of death. Baal warned his messengers of the dangers of Mot, but Mot continually threatens Baal and it's not until a daughter of El and Asherah, the goddess of the sun, Shapash, warns Mot that El will turn against him if he continues to battle Baal, that Mot concedes the battle. At one point during the story, Mot kills Baal and reigns supreme before Baal is brought back to life to battle Mot. Could this have been symbolic to the Canaanites of periods of drought, waiting for the weather deity Baal to come back to life and bring rain to fertilise the land again. We will come back to Baal later in the podcast. Melkart. When the culture that we primarily associate with the Phoenicians emerged, and by that I mean the seafaring traders, then the city of Tyre emerged as the powerhouse of Phoenician lands. Now for the sake of simplifying things, I'm going to make an assumption that the Phoenicians and the Canaanites are the same peoples and that the Phoenicians actually referred to themselves as Canaanites and that it was the Greeks who referred to these people as the Phoenicians. In biblical writings, we see them referred to as the Canaanites and in Latin and Greek scripts, we see them referred to as the Phoenicians. Tyre had its own supreme deity, just like many other cities, as we have already clarified. Tyre's deity was called Melkart, and as the lead Phoenician city when it came to their Mediterranean expansion, Melkart would become an extremely important Punic deity in general. And there were temples built for him throughout Punic lands. When we say Punic, 
we refer to Phoenicians and subsequently the Carthaginians, all of whom share the same bloodlines as we discovered in the last podcast. In the last podcast, we mentioned the very important Carthaginian trade colony based at the modern-day Spanish city of Cardis. And it was here that the Carthaginians would construct a temple dedicated to Melkart. This temple would be one of the last places that Hannibal would visit before his famous crossing of the Alps to confront the Romans. Hannibal, being a Carthaginian, would be a faithful worshipper of Melkart and as such would make the pilgrimage to Cardis before embarking on one of the most highly regarded military journeys of history. Hannibal's achievements are going to be saved for a future podcast, but the purpose of this passage is to discuss the deity of Melkart and the high esteem in which the Punic peoples held him in. The 5th century Greek historian Herodotus travelled to Tyre during his own lifetime to look for clues about the deity of Tyre. But throughout his writings, he referred to the deity as Heracles. Now, Heracles is actually a character of Greek mythology, who is a son of Zeus and a god or a hero of athleticism. Herodotus clearly links the deity of Tyre to the Greek mythological legend Heracles. So we could assume that Melkart and Heracles are thought of as being the same person, just that each culture had a name in their own language for him. Subsequently, the Romans adopted Heracles into their own stories of mythology, and as such, they renamed him Hercules. Now, this is where it gets interesting, because in the last episode, we spoke of the Pillars of Hercules, which is the name given to the promontories which are either side of the Strait of Gibraltar. And what we mean by promontories are peaks of land that act as an iconic gateway between the familiarity of the Mediterranean Sea and the dangerous Atlantic Ocean, a gateway which it is suggested that only the Phoenicians dared to breach in order to reach the metal-rich societies of the British Isles and West Africa. According to legend, the Pillars of Hercules are so named as the westernmost extent of the travels of Hercules during his Twelve Labours, a Greek mythological story. Could it therefore be pure coincidence that the place where the Phoenicians dared to cross is possibly named after their own deity, Melkart, because of this link, even if it is somewhat tenuous? Tenuous links can sometimes be all that we as historians have to go on, especially when it comes to the origins of religion and spirituality. The classical cultures of Rome, Carthage and Greece seem to all have very similar polytheistic worship practices where many different gods exist for many different things and this can be traced back to the cultures of the ancient Near East who although had a supreme city deity are still recorded as worshipping multiple gods and this creation of gods for many different aspects of nature could even connect us to the shamanistic animism of prehistory that could be the purpose of the portable and parietal art of the upper paleolithic something we explored way back in volume one temples and sacrifice the people of cardis are very proud of their city and its heritage especially its Punic links. Cardis was founded by the Phoenicians and used as a base by the Carthaginians while preparing for the Punic Wars against the Romans. We mentioned that Hannibal went on pilgrimage to Cardis before setting off across the Alps to meet the Romans. Strabo was a Greek historian that lived from the 1st century BCE to the 1st century CE and he mentions the temple of Tyrian Heracles, which we may otherwise call Melkart, in the city of Cardis. Strabo writes that there were two bronze pillars within the temple and that these pillars were regarded by some to be the true pillars of Hercules. It is also mentioned that Hannibal made 
sacrifices at this temple. Now, this could refer to animal sacrifice, something which we believe has been part of human society for a very long time. Certainly, we studied the cave paintings of the Upper Paleolithic and one conclusion that we speculated on was that there must have been some form of ritual in regards to nomadic hunting. When humans became agricultural, it may no longer have been necessary to carry out the same rituals, but there is very likely to have been some form of ritual to ensure a successful harvest or production of fertile livestock, and it is possible that particular animals were sacrificed as an offering to the deities who would ensure agricultural success in response. This might sound bizarre, but would your ancient society take the risk of not performing these rituals if it meant that the weather gods would not bless your lands with rain, or that they would grant more favour to the next city who were competing with yours for the fertile lands in between? Not honouring rituals was not worth the risk, so these sacrifices were necessary, and this points us towards an even more grim reality of ancient life, that being the sacrifice of humans. The best example that we have given of this is the grave of Queen Puabi, who was buried in the Royal Cemetery of Or in the 3rd millennium BCE. There, humans and animals were sacrificed, probably to accompany her into the afterlife. At first glance, the entourage of humans may have willingly poisoned themselves. However, closer examinations of the bodies indicate that some of them may have been struck about the head to incapacitate them. Either way, it would appear that these sacrifices must have been seen as a necessity and the fear of not sacrificing living beings must have outweighed the horror of doing it. The Romans and Greeks would have us believe that the Phoenicians and Carthaginians sacrificed their children to the gods. But there are also historians that oppose this saying that this is Greco-Roman propaganda. In my opinion, certainly human and animal sacrifice is very much a part of our history whether we like it or not. It's probably not a case of whether sacrifice took place as how much sacrifice did each particular culture carry out. The Bible states that the Canaanites carried out gruesome sacrifice of children by burning them alive. So there is definitely an infanticide connection there. But all the sources were enemies of the Canaanites, Phoenicians and Carthaginians. So we may never know the entire truth. Yahweh The reported place of Canaanite child sacrifice, according to the Hebrew Bible, was Tophet. And one opponent of this practice was Yahweh. Yahweh is a name given to the God of Iron Age Israel and Judah. Certainly around the time of the Siege of Lachish, which was the subject of our podcast's episode 8. His name was was represented by four letters, Y-H-W-H. The reason for this is because the name was being written in what we've referred to as an abjad style of writing, which is when an alphabet with no vowels is being used. Arabic, Hebrew and Syriac alphabets are a good modern example of abjads. The most famous archaic abjad is the Phoenician alphabet, which is something we mentioned in episode 9. The name Yahweh was first written in Phoenician script by using four letters, which have been translated into the Latin script as YHWH. And the vowel sounds that need to be inserted to make the name vocal have been a matter for much debate. Most people will say the name as Yahweh. But if we break down the name into its four-letter form, which is actually directly called the Tetragrammaton, we can turn Y-H-W-H into the phonetic sounds Y, H, W, H. And by shifting the sounds, which is a common thing in language evolution, 
we can suppose that the Y sound transformed into a J sound and the W sound transformed into a V sound. So Y, H, W, H transformed into J, H, V, H. And this is the origin of the name Jehovah, which we find most commonly used for the Christian movement called Jehovah's Witnesses, who are literally God's public witnesses to the missionary work within their communities that they are well known for. After the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem in the 6th century BCE, Jewish people accepted Yahweh as their universal God, which claims the God of Israel to be supreme and refers to him as the Lord, due to his name Yahweh being deemed to be too divine to be uttered. However, the name Israel itself contains the word El, which in this sense means God, as we mentioned right at the very beginning of the podcast. Biblical texts explain this by stating that El and his queen consort Asherah had many sons, one being Baal, who we spoke of earlier, and another being Yahweh, who was given the nation of Israel by his father El. According to biblical texts, it was the king of Judah called Josiah who proclaimed that Yahweh should be worshipped exclusively by the Jews. Hebrews. So there is a serious danger of us getting lost in detail and trying to describe things which are ambiguous and contentious if we are trying to literally translate and understand every script. Many Phoenician scripts have been lost due to the fact that they like to use parchment, which doesn't stand the test of time like clay tablets. But we do believe that some of the works of Hebrew texts, such as those written in the Hebrew Bible, derive from Phoenician writings. In essence, we can talk about peoples and we can talk about the evolution of God as a concept. So let's firstly tackle the peoples. We can say that the most likely conclusions of all that we have studied is to say that the Canaanite people lived in the Levant for as long as we care to believe, so potentially from the dawn of ancient times 5,000 years ago. There appears to be no evidence of supplanting cultures, just subjugation. So we can say that from the Canaanites we get the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians. It is feasible to say that they are all one and the same bloodline, just referred to by different names according to the source of the name and the period that we're talking about. These Levantine peoples are probably comparatively closely related to the original people of the first kingdoms of Israel and Judah, and as such as the first peoples who we may refer to as Hebrew and ultimately what the Greco-Romans would attribute as synonymous to the Jewish people in general. In today's world, we refer to the Semitic-speaking Israelites as Hebrew. All Israelites are biblically believed to be descendants of Abraham, who is the patriarch of Judaism as well as Christianity and Islam, and who may have been born in the Mesopotamian city of Ur. The tribe of Benjamin was one of the 12 tribes of Israel mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. One of the members of this tribe was called Saul and it was he who would become the first king of the united monarchy of Israel. It is suggested that all of this happened in the 11th century BCE. As the king of Israel, Saul falls out of favour with God and this is when David takes a prominent place in the story of the birth of Judaism. King David According to the Hebrew Bible, God favoured the young Israelite called David, who was a humble shepherd with a reputation for fighting off wild animals in the duty of protecting his flock. During the war with the Philistines, the mightiest Philistine warrior called Goliath, would call out the strongest Israelite 
to meet him on the battlefield. Goliath was so huge that he struck fear into the hearts of the Israelites. But when David overheard Goliath's challenge, despite not being an Israelite soldier, he asked King Saul to let him face Goliath, believing that God was with him. Saul obliged and David met Goliath on the battlefield. This legendary battle between the mightiest mountain of a man, the Philistine Goliath, and the humble young Israelite shepherd, David, echoes down to modern day. With the shot of a sling, David defeated Goliath, winning the Israelites the unlikeliest victory over the Philistines in the most legendary underdog victory. David's popularity within Israel would soar and Saul would realise how out of favour he had become by comparison to David. When David ultimately became the king of the Israelites, he would take Jerusalem from the Jebusites who occupied it. He would then go on to rule Israel for 40 years before being replaced by his son, Solomon. King Solomon King Solomon would be the last king of the united monarchy of Israel as the country would be split into two after Solomon's death. The kingdom of Israel would emerge from the north while the kingdom of Judah would emerge from the south. Jerusalem would become the capital city of the kingdom of Judah and a temple dedicated to Solomon was completed in 953 BCE at Mount Zion in the capital city itself. The temple's deity was Yahweh and such was its beauty that many would travel great distances to see it. The Ark of the Covenant, containing stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, would find a permanent home here. Those Hebrew men of the lands of Israel were encouraged to make regular pilgrimages to the temple to affirm their worship of Yahweh, the true God. Any worship taking place at other temples and shrines would be considered to be idolatry. Idolatry is the worship of idols or false gods. In another sense, it is the worship of anyone other than Yahweh, the almighty God of the lands of Israel. It is this version of monotheism that led to the birth of the great monotheistic faiths of the modern world, namely Judaism, Christianity and Islam otherwise known as the Abrahamic religions. After Solomon's death, the kingdom of Israel would split. Judaism The kings of Israel and Judah after Solomon were, as one might expect, differing in their degrees of piety in regards to the worship of the deity of Solomon's temple at Jerusalem, namely Yahweh. Prophets, who represented God's word, would warn peoples of the kingdom of Israel and Judah that they may attract their ultimate destruction should they not change their ways. As such, and as we learned earlier in the podcast series, the Assyrians would come to the Levantine lands and they would take Israel and destroy Judah. We concentrated quite closely on this during episode 8 on the siege of Lachish, which took place in 701 BCE. What we do know is that Jerusalem was spared as the king Hezekiah may have come to terms with the Assyrians and spared the capital city as a consequence. After the fall of the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonians would become the dominant power of the Near East. Biblical texts state that prophets continued to warn the people of Judah to remain faithful to their covenant with God but this was in vain to some degree as is stated to be the reason for the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. The Babylonians were so enraged with the rebelliousness of the Judeans that they destroyed Solomon's temple and deported all of the elite class of Judeans. It would not be until the Babylonians were defeated by the Achaemenid Persians that the Judeans were permitted to return to Judah and a second temple was constructed on Temple Mount in Jerusalem to replace Solomon's temple. 
which we mentioned had been destroyed. A date of 516 BCE is offered as the beginning of worship at this new temple. During their exile, the Jewish people decided that the existence of any god other than Yahweh should be denied, taking things one step further than the movement against idolatry and cementing monotheism as a recognised attribute of the Jewish people. So, what happened to El and Baal? El was really no longer spoken of in the monotheistic world and there was no room for talk of Baal and any talk of Baal was viewed as a thing of shame. However, some do interpret that Baal and Yahweh are in fact one and the same thing. So there is no real concluding evidence of how these names really came and went and how they related to each other. And it's very likely that different interpretations of information existed between different tribes. So it's pretty much impossible to find a definitive story. In fact, the Canaanite god Baal is associated with a Philistine god, the Lord of the Flies, Baal Zebub, who has been since regarded in Abrahamic religions as a major demon and whose name in the Christian church is more widely known as Beelzebub, which is another name for the devil. Next time, we're going to wrap up our story of the ancient Near East by bringing you another one of our summary episodes before we make the geographical move to Egypt, where we will go back in time and pick up the story from the end of the prehistoric volume. Thank you very much for engaging with this week's podcast. A bit of a diversion from the normal chronology of history, but really I think these episodes are important to gain an understanding of the spiritual beliefs of the people of these areas and potentially why they went about their day-to-day lives in the way that they did, because some of the rituals and uh, day-to-day behaviours seem quite bizarre to us. So it's I think it's quite important for us to visit the mindsets of these people and their ritualistic behaviour. I think it it opens a door to us in the way that we can maybe view their behaviours. I received a message from one of our Patreons, Karen Pleschertsnig, who said, thanks for taking on a uh, such an ambitious podcast subject. I'm still in the early episodes. Great job on sound quality in those early days. It usually takes podcasts a while to get that right. Looking forward to all the podcasts I have to catch up on. Thanks to the good sound quality I can listen while driving. Thanks very much, Karen. That's a really valuable message for me. The podcast was criticised recently for the sound quality. I sort of re-listened and I thought, oh, I can't really see that it's too bad, but I did try and open it up to see if anyone else would criticise it, and nobody has actually, and Karen, I think you've affirmed that the sound quality is quite good. Hopefully, if it isn't, or if there is anything sort of defective about the podcast quality, um, you'll be kind enough to let me know. There's no shame in being critical Um, it's the way that things get better so please bring it on if you're struggling in any way at all with the podcast I think I mentioned possibly in the last podcast that I developed a bibliography page for the website Um, so please visit that there I'm also developing a couple of other pages one of them will be uh, a page to Uh, to direct you towards links that have been useful in the creation of the podcast so all the links that were ever posted on social media I'm hoping to gather them all up and put them on one page because if you maybe listen to the uh, the sixth episode of uh, volume one then you'll know that there was reference to Washo the Chimpanzees videos on YouTube and now that they've gone so far down the Facebook page they're almost irretrievable so what I would like to do is put them in a permanent place so that anyone visiting the podcast for the first time can then go and discover these links. It also uh, gives somewhere to go to have a little play about with some of the interactive websites that have been quite fun to play with and also those web links that have been sent in by 
fans of the podcast who have found things that have astonished me and um, have entertained me. So I'd like to share those with you. So we're working on that. The other page that we're looking to create is a list of podcasts um, that we uh, are familiar with and podcasts that we promote. So generally speaking, I mean, I've always said it, one of my big favourites is the Rex Factor. that have, uh, They've just entered into Series 3, which I've been anticipating for a long time, so I'm looking forward to getting my teeth into Series 3 of Rex Factor. If you like your English and uh, British history, then I highly recommend that one. It's a very good, laid-back, good-humoured podcast, and it's very well worth a listen you might well become addicted to it another one of the podcasts which i always recommend is the history of ancient greece by ryan stitt who tirelessly promotes the work of others including my work so he deserves all the promotion that we give him in return and uh, it's a really good high quality podcast so i strongly recommend that one Going off on a bit of a tangent, I was invited by one of our listeners, Joel McKinnon, to listen to his Rock Opera podcast, which I was a little bit hesitant about listening to at first because I'm often listening to history narratives and and reading history books, so I don't often give myself a lot of time for such entertainment. However, I was uh, embarking on a long drive during the week and I decided I'm going to give this a go and find out what it's all about. And I was actually really hooked to it and I listened to it from start to finish in one go and I really, really enjoyed it. So I'm going to recommend it to the uh, History of the World podcast listening uh, public. So if you want to give it a try, you might find it's very enjoyable. I, I thought it was an absolute quality job. He enlisted the help of Doug Metzger, who does the Literature and History podcast. And I mentioned him previously in reference to his work on the Epic of Gilgamesh and how he brought that to life during one of his podcasts. Doug Metzger is a really, really skilled narrator and uh, he really does justice to Joel McKinnon's work. So give it a go. You might just love it. I know that I did. I was really blown away and pleasantly surprised by how great it was and uh, really it was such an engaging project and, you know... You can do it in three hours, the whole thing in three hours, and uh, and I, I recommend it. Give it a go, you might enjoy it. It's called Planet and Sky, and it's by Joel McKinnon. I shall post a link on the social media pages. Now, talking of social media, if you're not following me on Twitter, what are you waiting for? Um, follow me on Twitter, it's at Hot World Podcast. Uh, hot being H-O-T, History of the World Podcast, Hot World Podcast. Follow me on Twitter. There's a lot of useful stuff going back and forwards, a lot of link sharing as well. So we're really getting the History of the World listeners community um, interacting with each other, um, which is really my wish. That I think that that is what it's all about, promoting history, interacting, sharing ideas. This is really what educates all of us together. So come and join in with the interaction on Twitter. Okay, so now, before we sign off for the week, uh, we're going to introduce a new feature, and this is called the Patreon Question Time. So what we do at this point, we invite our Patreons, the ones that uh, contribute... Uh, more than $10 to the show and you can do that by visiting the Patreon website Uh, so you can find links on social media website and through the historyoftheworldpodcast.com website Uh, you can contribute towards the show's running costs obviously we've got the website we've got the the podcast hosting platform and uh, not to mention all the uh, the books and materials that we have to buy to keep the show going. So if you go to the Patreon page and donate to us, and if you accrue more than $10 in donations, you get to ask a question. And this is exactly what uh, Matty Yokimo has done. He's written in and to uh, say, I'd like to know how do the Empire's borders come to be defined? 
like the Roman Empire, they didn't have maps per se, did they, like we have? How did they know where their borders were? Was it just because all the hostile were put to the sword and there was no more rebellions that region became part of the empire? Or did they even consider it like that? Is the whole maps, borders of empire much more of a modern thing? Did scholars ponder where the borders were and decided uh, or guess where the limits were? One ended and the uh, and the, uh, the other empire started. So there, how did our definition of empire borders happen? It's an excellent question. There's no straightforward answer to this. Uh, but it's such a good question and something that I've thought about in the past when reading about history the nature of borders and um, and how it differs from one society to another and from one time uh, to another. I'm going to attempt to answer the question. Um, I'm going to try and uh, pinpoint six examples of borders that I can uh, see throughout history and see if it sort of educates us a bit more about the nature of empire and kingdom and country borders. So the first example I'm going to talk about is when uh, we go back to ancient times and something we've touched upon. When the Battle of Kadesh took place between the Hittites and the Egyptians in the 13th century BCE, where were the borders? Well, there was no real treaty that we know of before this happened. So we can only assume that the borders were where the nearest military units said the borders were. So if you were living in that area and there there was a Hittite military unit who said listen you answer to me then you probably answered to that military unit so until the Egyptians came along and kicked the Hittites out and made you subject to them made you pay tribute to them then the border would shift and you would be on the other side of it so the borders would not have been a politically agreed Uh, line I don't think during ancient times it would have actually been whoever was the one bullying you the most is where you were in terms of the border of the empire if we fast forward to the Roman Empire certainly where I live in uh, Great Britain we can see evidence of a border there where the Romans uh, built a border built a wall which signified the border of the extent of their empire, basically. So the Romans decided to build a border, and that was where the border was. Who's going to argue with a with a stone wall that's fortified? Thanks very much. That is the border. So that was how the Romans dealt with it. They actually built the border. And this would in turn lead to uh, maybe a division between England and Scotland ultimately. There there always seemed to be that traditional boundary between the English and the Scottish um, over the course of the, uh, the history of the British Isles. We can certainly see that there was a lot of disputes between where the border lied between England and Scotland and it really was just a case of military action pushing the border one way or the other. So uh, depending on where your army stuck their flag, basically. So if, uh, for example, King Edward I decided to march north and move the border between England and Scotland another 50 miles north, then he could effectively do that through conquest. Um, Certainly then there had to be sort of legal documents as well to determine... Uh, what would happen if someone committed a crime uh, on the opposite side of the border. So if an Englishman committed a crime on Scottish turf, where would he then go to be tried for his crime and and under whose law? So there would be a lot of treaties. So there was very much a, a legal reason for defining the borders, uh, certainly in medieval times and in, in different parts of the world. So there would maybe be a legal understanding that was written into a a legal document or a treaty to determine where the border was. Certainly then if we go forward into the modern world and and probably uh, the period of uh, colonialisation when uh, maybe the European powers uh, subjugated most of Africa to themselves so they basically carved up the map of Africa and if you look at the modern map of Africa you will see a lot of straight line borders and this is a very very unnatural thing this is where Europeans sat down with a map of Africa and a ruler and a pen 
and basically said, there we go, draw a line, uh, Germany's uh, territory is one side of the border and English territory is the other side of the border. So very, very um, clinical treatment of the map of Africa. And as such, this would mean displacement of people, the ethnicities of people. So, so the modern countries of Africa today do not reflect the ethnicities of Africa that were historical then. So like we basically, as Europeans, we created the countries of Africa and they're not, they're not really accurate according to the ethnicities and to the kingdoms and the local um, tribes, kingdoms and ethnicities of Africa are not recognised by these country borders. Similar thing happened when uh, India and Pakistan were divided in the 20th century by the British Empire as it was then, and before they went fully independent as nations, there was really a lot of displaced people by this border. And it was, um, you know, if you're going to draw a border and you're going to divide um, cultures by, by means of one line through the middle of a country, then you are going to get an awful lot of displaced people and there's some very, very uh, raw uh, feelings attached to that, um, to that period of history, to that episode in the division of the old Indian Raj. In the modern world, we see that um, certainly with uh, the Crimean Peninsula, where, uh, you know, where is the border? Um, in terms of uh, how many countries of the world look at the Crimean Peninsula, it belongs to the Ukraine. However, following the, the unrest of 2014, uh, the Russians would tell you that uh, the Crimea belongs to them. So where is the actual border? And it, it's really, uh, the lesson we learn is the border is really where you decide it is. So um, unless two countries can agree on where a border is, um, if they can put it on paper, then fine. If you can actually put a line in the in the sand or, or, or actually build a border, then that's quite categorical. But then also, if two parties can't agree where the border is, then the border really only exists in the imagination of both of those countries. So borders are really not real things. They're only real if humans can agree where they belong. And that's really what the nature of borders is. And in most cases, um, in a peace um, in a peace chasing world, countries do agree on where the borders exist, and in most cases they're not disputed, but in some cases they very much still are. I mean, you only have to look at maybe the border between Ethiopia and Somalia um, to see that it's incomplete. Um, so there you go, that really is what borders is. They're an imaginary line at the end of the day, essentially, it's an imaginary line. And it's only any good if both parties, either side of that border, honour it. What a fantastic question, Matty Yoakim. I hope I've managed to get near to the answer for you. And I'm sure there are historians and scholars out there that could give you a much more competent answer. But I did promise I would answer your question. And, and therefore, I've done my best to do that. So hopefully, um, hopefully that was at least interesting and a bit insightful. Well, that's it for this week. And uh, next week, we will be rounding off the Near East. The ancient Near East will bring it all to a close uh, in readiness to move on to our next set of podcasts, which will be about ancient Egypt. So that will be in two weeks' time. So I'd really like to thank you for listening to the podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we look forward to uh, meeting up with each other Again, one week from now. The History of the World podcast is available on many different podcast platforms. So please don't forget to rate and review us wherever you find us. Visit our website at historyoftheworldpodcast.com and email us at historyoftheworldpodcast at mail.com. Support the podcast at Patreon by clicking the Support the Podcast link at our website and join us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, 
and Tumblr.